Our work is a critical part of what defines us as people, and what defines our work is rapidly changing thanks to advances in technologies. From robotics to AI to IoT and beyond, we're reimagining the workplaces of the future and creating exciting new ways to be productive, inclusive and accessible. Canadian innovators are bringing this bold vision to life with equal parts boundless optimism and unbridled creativity. Let's explore this Northern Spark. Thanks for joining us on Northern Spark. I'm Michael Bancroft. And I'm Chris Pereira. Thanks a lot for being here with us today. Well, the future of work is something that touches all of us, and it's exciting to see Canadians play such a leading role in crafting it. So let's find out more about what the future looks like from some of the innovators making it possible. Shailen Agrawal is the founder and CTO of Animotion in Vancouver. Dave Kim is the co-founder and CEO of Harbour in Halifax. Brianna Blaney is the co-founder and CEO of DeepEnd in Vancouver, and Kareem Ayad is the founder and CEO of Cerebian in Toronto. Thanks to all of you for being with us. I want to start with this question everyone is asking. What does the future of work look like in the post-pandemic world once the worst of the coronavirus pandemic is behind us? Let's start with you, Shailen. I think there has been an increasing trend towards remote work before the pandemic started. In the future, I think remote work is uh, definitely a positive option that companies will seriously consider, but sort of mix happens between remote and on-site work remains to be seen. But I think uh, there are open challenges in terms of technology and uh, adoption that, 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 that are yet to be overcome. Kareem, I'm curious uh, from your perspective, what you think the uh, technologies are going to be that will play the biggest role in this new normal? VR will bring people closer together in a remote setting. Um, a augmented reality uh, where the internet and apps will be uh, everywhere we look rather than just on a specific screen and bring computer interface, which is what we're working on at Cerebian, will entirely redefine the way humans interact with computers. Um, AI will not replace, it will augment humans. Uh, doctors will rely on that uh, for prognosis, diagnosis, and precision medicine. And finally, I think quantum computing and 5G will power the infrastructure of all of the technologies that we just mentioned. There's a lot of economic uncertainty right now and likely will be for some time. So, Brianna, how can employers keep their staff motivated and productive? I think one of the largest contributions an employer can make to resolving some of this for their people is twofold. It's giving them choice and focusing heavily on communication and ensuring that your people understand what you've put in place to support them, the choices that you're able to give them around working flexibly should they need to to support their children or being in the office. Choice and communication, I think, are two of the strongest ways employers can support their people during times of uncertainty to keep them motivated and productive. Dave, do you think that remote collaboration technologies are going to make physical workplaces obsolete one day? No, I don't think so, not at all. I mean, collaboration isn't the problem. And I think that uh, Brianna hit the nail on the head. It's, it's all about culture. So the physical workplace is essential and will continue to be essential. And what you do with it will be a big part of why people will choose to work with you. And I think the biggest thing today is actually mandating that decision on the workspace models. So you really need to think about uh, how you want that to affect your business um, and your workspace and drive it from the top down. Kareem, how will the physical workspaces of the future change as new technologies become part of our everyday lives? For example, if you and I are working, uh, collaborating on, uh, on the design of a car, we'd be doing that uh, in real time, standing right in front of each other with the car in front of us in augmented reality and building the software. Um, robotics will automate a lot of uh, uh, um, certain jobs, but it will turn them into high-level uh, managerial jobs, um, freeing up more creativity and more focus on customer service. Uh, for example, the way um, brain-computer interface uh, will affect physical workspaces is, for example, if, you're, if we're talking to each other, I'm going to be able to uh, Google something uh, with my brain and get the answer in my ears immediately. This is something actually we prototype, so it's very immediate uh, in terms of its, uh, its status for commercialization. Shailen, we've been talking a lot about offices and office space, which are, of course, located in cities. How do you see the design of cities themselves changing in the future? Today, uh, the cities are designed with a concept of a central business district, so to say, where everybody commutes to, works out of office spaces together in a same physical environment. 
in today's world, uh, maybe that uh, with with the, with the advent of remote work, uh, people might choose to work either from their homes or from a community office within their neighborhood or, or some office space that they can work out of where they don't physically work next to their office mates, but remotely connect with them, but they still work from out of an office environment that they can walk to. Businesses are gathering so much data on their performance and it is a lot to manage. So Dave, how can they filter out the noise and find those hidden insights? I think this is exactly where we'll see some really practical use cases of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. But for most industries and companies, using performance-related data crosses over that line of privacy. And I think about human resources data, for example. It's hugely important into creating more successful employees, creating better team dynamics in companies, but it's highly private. When you take a look at, for example, continual learning, it's already a prerequisite in regards to the workforce today. But what is interesting is the debate on who should actually pay for it. Should it be the employer or the employee? Brianna, I'm interested to get your thoughts on this. We believe that employers are ultimately responsible for resourcing the success of their people at work. So when you consider a job-related skill development, we believe that that is a cost an employer should be willing to bear. And you see that returned to them in value when you consider things like employee tenure and their ongoing commitment to the business, but also the increasing output and productivity. It's been a great conversation, guys. I've got one more I'll throw out to all of you. What's the one thing people should do to prepare for the future of work? I think uh, if we spend more time thinking about how we support our teams personally, uh, rather than micro-optimizing our processes, I think that's where success uh, lies. Yeah, I agree with that. I think for employers, that hyper-individualized experience at work is where we're going to see a lot of momentum and growth. So for employers, I think that's a big focus. And when it comes to individuals and people, I would say focus on keep learning and be curious because we've never seen the pace of change as rapid as it is now. I believe your biggest asset is your people. Focus on uh, keeping your skills and the skills of your team competitive um, and stay up to date on emerging tech because innovation cycles are becoming shorter than ever. From an employee perspective, I think like time management has been critical and it's even more so when you're working remotely, offline, disconnected uh, physically from the rest of the world. So take breaks, uh, walk around, and but have a focused period of time when you're working so that you can be effective during that time while also um, balancing your work and life. Fascinating conversation, guys, but we'll have to leave it there. Thanks so much for your time. So, Chris, it sounds as though the common thread between all of these future of work solutions is the seamless access to data. So what technologies do you think will enable more data collection, more powerful data collection and applications? So it's all about data in the future for sure. And uh, actually, the, the pain point is not going to be, do we have data, which is sometimes the pain point now. It's going to be, what data are we collecting? Why are we collecting data? And sometimes, do we even need to collect more data? Um, how we analyze it and how we actually use it in the field is also going to be the, the challenge. Are we prepared? Do we have enough infrastructure to support all of this data that's being created? Oh, it's a good question. I think industry will have some uh, upskilling to do in terms of uh, knowing how to use artificial intelligence. And in the vertical industries, as we move forward, uh, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I don't know anything about artificial intelligence as a small business owner. Um, how do I use that? And um, an analogy I like to use is websites these days. Um, you actually don't need to know the zeros and ones or HTML even to do a website. You sort of drag and drop the uh, different uh, components onto the website. And I think we're going to see that in industries too with artificial intelligence. So making it more accessible to the everyday person with drag and drop solutions. So automation and speed is a big piece of the puzzle. You can let us know what you think about the future of work and where it's headed. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn and let us know so we can keep this conversation going. Well, that just about does it for Northern Spark. But before we go, take a look at this exciting vision for the future of work. Toronto startup Tiger Robotics is working on a robotics platform that blends man with machine like never before. It allows an operator to remotely control a robot as if it was an extension of their own body. All they need is a virtual reality headset and a handheld motion tracking device. Tiger's vision system gives the operator a very detailed sense of depth and scale through the robot's eyes. This makes it possible to perform very precise movements and tasks using the robot's gripping arm. Picking up objects, placing them inside tight spaces, and flipping switches are no problem for this prototype. It makes dirty, dangerous, and demanding jobs much safer for everyone without sacrificing productivity. Well, that does it for the show. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.